Good morning, and welcome to the recession, non-power, and advanced reactors, merging of two worlds. My name is Robert Taylor, and I'm the Deputy Office Director for the NRC Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, and I will be the chair of the session today. We will be focusing on the relationship between non-power and advanced reactors, how insights from designing, licensing, constructing, and operating non-power facilities are informing the development of advanced reactors and how the technology development and licensing approaches for advanced reactors are influencing non-power facilities. This morning, we will begin with a brief introduction into non-power and advanced reactor and advanced reactors before we dive into the discussions with our speakers. We will then begin our Q&A period. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the session, and we will address them during the Q&A period. Your questions can be directed to a specific speaker or to all speakers. Next slide, please. For our panel today, we welcome representatives with diverse perspectives on both non-power and advanced reactors from industry, universities, and federal government organizations. First, we have Allison Hahn. Ms. Hahn has been the Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy, has been with the Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy since 2011. She has managed several programs, including the Advanced Methods for Manufacturing and the Nuclear Science User Facilities within the Nuclear Energy enabling technologies program and most recently the light water reactor sustainability program currently she's the acting director for the nuclear reactor deployment which is focused on modernizing technologies and approaches applicable to both advanced reactors and light water reactors and supporting the deployment of a variety of advanced reactor designs she holds a bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering from pennsylvania state university and a master's degree in environmental engineering from John Hopkins University. We will also hear from Dr. Rusty Tao. Dr. Tao is the founding director for Abilene Christian University's premier research project called NEXT, Nuclear Energy Experimental Testing. Rusty has a BS degree in engineering physics from ACU and a PhD in nuclear physics from the University of Texas. He served in the U.S. Navy, where he rose to the rank of lieutenant while serving as an instructor at the Naval Nuclear Power School. Rusty completed a postdoctoral research fellowship, fellowship with Los Alamos National Laboratory, working on the Phoenix experiment at the Brookhaven National Lab. And in 2001, he joined the physics faculty at ACU. For the past 20 years, Rusty has worked at many different national labs on several information research projects. His 250 articles and other, other scholarly writings have been cited more than 30,000 times by peer-reviewed publications. Next, we will hear from Margaret Ellison. Ms. Ellison has 17 years of experience in nuclear industry and is currently a senior engineer with Kairos Power on the licensing team. She is responsible for licensing activities related to structural graphite materials, material control and counting, physical security, structural design, and instrumentation and control including the associated content in the preliminary safety analysis report for the Hermes non-power reactor. Before joining Kairos Power, Margaret had worked for 15 years at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in rulemaking, vulnerability analysis, probabilistic risk assessment, and material science research. Margaret earned a master's of science degree from the University of California at Berkeley in material science engineering. Finally, we have Brad Toma. Ashley Finnan was originally our end speaker, but she had some travel to come up. So we're excited to welcome Brad to the discussion. Brad Tilmer is Chief Operating Officer at the National uh, Reactor Innovation Center at the Idaho National Laboratory, managing the day-to-day -day operations of the center. Brad is applying a lean startup approach combined with advanced, react advanced engineering processes and lessons learned from experience managing large energy demonstrations to accelerate the demonstration and deployment of advanced nuclear energy. Brad has a rich history of deploying advanced technologies. Prior to entering, Brad served as interim CEO and vice president of operations for Avitas Systems and chief engineer and general manager of advanced technology for GE Oil and Gas. Prior to GE, Brad served as chief operating officer at the National Energy Technology Laboratory, implementing science and technology programs across the energy industry. He has a BS degree in petroleum and natural gas en engineering from the Pennsylvania State University and an MBA for George Mason University. We're very excited to hear the presentation this morning. Next slide, please. So 
what are we talking about when we say non-power and advanced reactors? There are many different types of facilities. What are the differences? How do we know which type we are referring to? Most people understand that what a nuclear power plant is, but with smaller designs, there are many terms and they tend to overlap. The next slide, please. The NRC has successfully licensed and the nuclear industry has safely operated both non-power research and test reactors and large light water reactors. These technologies are the current bookends to a potential spectrum of new and advanced power and non-power reactors. The designs now being contemplated for deployment in the United States vary in power level, cooling technology, fuel design, safety features, and operational facilities from what has, from what has been previously licensed and operated. This will require a new and different thinking for how to demonstrate and assess safety. We aren't starting totally from a blank sheet given our prior experience, but we do need to be thoughtful to ensure we don't inappropriately bias our thinking about these new technologies by prior experiences that may not be applicable. To help us ensure that we are starting from a common point for today's presentation, I'll give you a brief introduction to it, a few types of facilities that we might hear about today. Full definitions of these terms can be found in the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act and Title 10 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Advanced reactors refer to nuclear fission or fusion reactors with significant improvements compared to commercial nuclear reactors. These improvements can include additional inherent safety features, greater fuel utilization, and enhanced reliability, among others. A research reactor is a non-power production or utilization facility, which is, I will define in a moment. It is specifically licensed under 10 CFR Part 50.21 which is a specific type of license for research and development. A testing facility is a nuclear reactor which has a thermal power level more than 10 megawatts, or for certain configurations, a thermal power more than one megawatt. A production facility is a facility designed and used primarily for the formation of plutonium or uranium-233, or the processing of irradiated materials containing special nuclear material. A utilization facility is almost the opposite of a production facility. There are facilities other than those designed or used primarily for the formation of plutonium or uranium 233. And a non power production or utilization facility is a broad term that means a production or utilization facility that is not a nuclear power reactor or a production facility, as I, as I defined earlier. Now that we have a bit of background on the topics to be discussed today, I'll turn it over to Allison Hahn to discuss the Department of Energy's role in non-power and advanced reactors. Allison? Thanks, Rob. And good morning, everyone. Good day and, and likely good evening. I'm Allison. Um, do we have slides up? There we go. You can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so we've known nuclear power to operate in a um, baseload capacity for decades now, but we see that changing and quickly. We need these reactors to operate flexibly with variable renewable energy sources to provide a more reliable grid, to provide heat and electricity, to decarbonize industry. Um, the department's support of the advanced reactors through the Advanced SMR program and our Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program is intended to provide the necessary support to vendors to successfully deploy their concepts and, and really motivate investment for future deployments. So we're supporting these designs through the marketplace, um, through dedicated R&D programs and competitively selected awards, uh, such as these on the slide here. So there are three first of a kind demonstrations here. I'm gonna go kind of counterclockwise here. So starting in the upper left, the Carbon Free Power Project is planning to construct the first new scale commercial demonstration plant in Idaho. Uh, moving down to the bottom left, we have the Natrium Reactor, a sodium cooled fast reactor planning to be sited at a former coal site in Wyoming. And then on the bottom right there, we've got X Energy planning to site their high temperature gas reactor at a site in Washington. And these three designs will be fully commercial designs and licensed by the NRC. And then if you continue on and, and make your way back to the top there in the upper right, uh, we've got five private public partnerships with lower maturity designs. Uh, both the Molten Chloride Fast Reactor Project and the Kairos FHR will uh, result in, in smaller scale test reactors to help inform their commercial designs. 
Uh, McCree will be authorized, will be DOE authorized to test their design at Idaho National Lab. And I know that Margaret will speak to it, but Kairos will obtain um, an NRC license for a site by Oak Ridge National Lab. And then Holtex SMR160 is the only light water reactor um, SMR in this list here and will focus on early stage design, engineering, and licensing activities. And then the last two we have are both microreactors. Westinghouse's Evinci will mature a heat pipe uh, cooled microreactor, and BWXC Banner re Reactor will mature a commercially viable transportable microreactor design. So these and other advanced reactor designs will help to address hard to decarbonize sectors like transportation, steel, cement, um, chemical production, and help us meet our clean energy goals of 100% clean energy sector by 2035 and a net zero economy by 2050. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, or, or um, ARDP, and the seven projects, but the ARDP program really goes beyond just those private-public partnerships. These designs, and, and all designs, require support throughout their life cycle, which takes us into the National Reactor Innovation Center here. Uh, NREC, um, again, is, is also part of ARDP. It's a relatively new program authorized by the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act of 2017 and was really formally established in 2019. So their mission is to enable and accelerate the development and demonstration of advanced reactors. And, and it's a national program, national DOE program, which is led by the Idaho National Laboratory and allows collaborators to harness the world-class capabilities of our national laboratory system. NRIC supports advanced reactor developers by providing access to infrastructure, materials, and expertise. They, uh, they, um, they also support other activities, such as helping to reduce the regulatory risks for advanced reactors, reducing the cost for advanced reactor construction, and filling experimental gaps that are vital to advanced reactor um, development and deployment. Next slide, please. So NRIC is working to establish demonstration test beds that will provide the infrastructure where industry or, or other users can start up, test, and operate their concepts in a safe and economical manner to obtain the data that they need to support their design activities and, and future licensing applications. So the first one we have here, the demonstration and operation of microreactor experiments or DOME. Uh, test bed will be capable of siting experiments that utilize DOE safeguards category four materials such as high SALEU and operate uh, at least at, at less than 10 megawatts thermal. So NRIC is working to reestablish the reactor demonstration test bed capabilities of the experimental breeder reactor two facility at the materials and fuels complex at INL to support the, um, this dome mission. The EBR2 facility provides a unique opportunity for NRIC to leverage an existing facility that is co-located with existing support capabilities at MSC. Uh, we expect construction of dome to be completed uh, in, in our fiscal year 2023 and to enable operations in fiscal year 24. And so NREC is also developing a second test bed capable of siting experiments that utilize safeguards category one materials, such as a high enriched uranium or plutonium and operate at 500 kilowatts thermal or less. Some of the advanced reactor concepts being developed have never been built or operated before. First of a kind nuclear technology developers need a location for testing, validating and maturing new reactor technologies or concepts and for validating the safety and workability of systems or components individually or as part of the overall reactor system. And although not required for the commercial concept, some reactor demonstrations and experiments require that higher enrichment fuel to keep the size of the reactor small uh, while ensuring that neutronics and thermal hydraulics are representative of their commercial designs. So this safeguards category one test bed would support the safe and economical testing and demonstration of those first of a kind reactor concepts. Uh, we are currently in the process of evaluating all options for this capability. Next slide. So another capability under development is the micro reactor applications research validation and evaluation or MARVEL for short. Uh, will serve as a unique small scale 20 kilowatt electric uh, nuclear test platform supporting experimental validation activities for operating regimes and really empower end use applications applicable to the broader micro reactor community. 
the difference between Marvel and those two NREC test sites is that INL will produce and construct an operational microreactor that will produce heat and power to a functional microgrid. Uh, the development of the microreactor will result in lessons learned for commercial developers, but will also create momentum, champion rapid technology maturation, and engage microreactor and user companies uh, directly. Technology developers will be able to test new microreactor technologies and will be able to evaluate systems for remote monitoring and develop autonomous control technologies. Next slide. So this is my last slide for today, but equally as important as all the other ones, even with the first of a kind deployments and demonstrations across the industry, the need for a versatile test reactor is so important. We're on the precipice of building a number of advanced reactors, but that doesn't necessarily mean they are as optimized as they could be. VTR will allow us to test and validate better optimized fuels and materials to continue advancing uh, these designs and continue increasing their economic competitiveness. I want to draw parallels to the role that the advanced test reactor um, out at INL has played for the past 50 years. It has provided accelerated fuels and materials irradiation that has supported the existing commercial fleet and the U.S. naval reactors. It is uh, this kind of testing that has supported the commercial nuclear industry and resulted in their improving fleet-wide performance from 60% um, availability range in the early uh, 80s to a fleet-wide performance of over 90% today. Um, what is missing now is the ability to support long-term innovation through the ability to conduct accelerated neutron damage testing. And, and a high-flux, fast-spectrum neutron test reactor will allow us to conduct those, uh, those tests. Next slide, please. I think that's it. Yeah. Allison, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask you a quick question here before we move on to the next speaker. That presentation was phenomenal. But Given the environment that we're in, how does DOE remain flexible with so many different technologies and vendors on the horizon? Right. And, and so many of these designs are available because of historical DOE investments. We've provided about $400 million in TRISO and graphite investments, and it's no surprise that many of the vendors are using it. Just looking at the only the ARDP winners, there's four reactors using TRISO fuel. So DOE has a history of supporting technologies that support multiple concepts. We work very hard to prioritize projects to ensure we are um, staying relevant with multiple designs. Of course, we can't support everyone through our directed R&D programs, but that's why we utilize um, our GAIN program, the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation and Nuclear Program, and, and a number of other industry support groups to help us get the pulse of industry and prioritize the work that we're doing. Wonderful, thank you for that, Allison. Now I'd like to turn it to, to Rusty from ACU to talk about uh, their activities. Hey, good morning, it's great to be with you. Thank you for your time and for the ability to be on this panel. It's an exciting panel where we're, we're trying to talk about how non-power and advanced reactors merge together. And I think that uh, what we're doing at Abilene Christian University is a great example of that. This is a, a melding of a university research reactor, um, and but not a traditional trigger. And so we're, we're looking at advanced reactors. We're very thankful for Natura Resources being a, a sponsor for this research. Um, and um, I'm very thankful for the chance to talk to you about it. Next slide, please. So NEXT stands for, for Nuclear Energy Experimental Testing. That's why we stood up here at Abilene Christian University with the idea that we, this is a great way of bringing hands-on experience to a large number of students. And we're really focused on finding global solutions to the world's critical needs. Next slide, please. And I, I'm sure this audience is aware of that, but it's always, in my opinion, worthy to remember what the, the goal is, because the goal of, the, of this deployed technology is extremely lofty. We'd really like to develop an energy source that's, that's clean and safe and, and really would, would change the standard of living of people, billions of people around the globe. And, and by building advanced reactors and having access to, uh, to new medical isotopes, we really have a chance to, to look at new treatments for cancer that have never been discussed before. So the, the, the access to medical isotopes, again, is something that will affect billions of people. And finally, if we can have a, a safe source of high process heat, then we can do a lot of things, um, including desalinate water or purify water, which is a need, again, around the world. So the, the way we think about this project and, and and working towards a deployment that will bless the world sometime is really uh, a driving force on this. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the image on the right is our molten salt test loop that's been in operation for over three years on our campus. Um, but uh, this is a great image to just remind people that the mission of our next lab is to provide global solutions to the world's needs for energy, water, and medical isotopes by advancing technology of molten salt reactors while educating future leaders in nuclear science and engineering. Next slide, please. So the two sort of focus areas of our research, we really wanted to do research that's uh, applicable to a lot of different designs. The first key uh, requirement we looked at is molten salt as a coolant. A molten salt has a lot of advantages of the coolant. It allows us to read high process temperatures while keeping the safety very, uh, the safety concerns very low because we never have the phase that transition to a steam. So by using a eutectic mixture of the right salts, we can have a low melting point while still having uh, no chance of flash to steam. The next slide, please. And the second key requirement that we really are focusing on is that we want to use liquid fuel in our reactor. Uh, so old solid fuel technology, uh, of course, uh, ends, ends up with throwing away a lot of useful uh, uranium. And so what we really want to do is we want to increase fuel utilization, we want to decrease waste, simultaneously get access to those medical isotopes, and then take advantage of a design that they can't melt down. So those are our two key requirements that we're really looking at. Next slide, please. So we're not doing this alone at, at ACU. Uh, we built a research alliance that we refer to as Nextra, our Next Research Alliance. And, and we're really thankful for our partners, the University of Texas, Texas A&M, Georgia Institute of Technology, have all joined with Abilene Christian University to work towards this goal. Uh, all four universities are being sponsored by Natura Resources. Next slide, please. We meet together regularly with workshops as we're working to develop our design and uh, develop our licensing work. Here's a, a workshop from last fall um, and where we have all four universities together. And, and despite what happened last year in March Madness, we work very well together uh, in this organization. Next slide, please. On the ACU campus, we have a, a, a wide variety of research projects, and I share this partly here just to allow you to understand what our students uh, get their hands on. Um, in the, the left-hand column is a lot of our salt systems. The top is our molten salt test loop. We've been operational for over three years. We're in the, the final commissioning stages of our fluoride molten salt test loop, which, which would be a high temperature uh, system. Uh, we're designing the end stages of designing a, a order of magnitude larger system referred to as the molten salt system that will allow us to both purify the salt and also work with larger quantities of salt and incorporate uh, elements of design from our reactor, including heat exchangers and other components. The, the second column is really uh, a lot of chemist work. And, and a lot of people refer to molten salt reactors as chemist reactors. And so how do you remove impurities? How do you uh, purify the salt? How do you know what the salt content is as it's changing? And so we have projects stood up to, to work on all of those things. The, the third column is uh, support that, expand, that expands across a lot of our systems, uh, instrumentation development, uh, data acquisition systems, and uh, filtering of salt. And the final column is individual component testing in the bottom right image is our molten salt research reactor, which is really the reactor that we're working to build and we're in the process of pre-licensing engagement with the NRC to talk about now. Um, everything on here with a star has some patented work or patent pending work on it. Uh, and so we're really trying to collect the intellectual property um, to, so that we can uh, develop this and deploy this commercially. Next slide, please. We're building our reactor design. We're leveraging heavily off of the molten salt reactor experiment. This was the reactor that was built and operated Oak Ridge National Lab in the 1960s. It was operated for four years. Uh, what we've done is we've tried to scale down from that. And so as we think about the reactor we're building, we're building a reactor that's easier to design than easier to design, build, and get licensed, hopefully, than the 1960s. Of course, in the 60s, it didn't have to go through the NRC, but uh, we're working on a design that uses low enriched fuel that has a lower power density and doesn't have the main safety concern of this water and salt mixing. And so we're not having any water in our, our reactor enclosure. Next slide, please. We are though, however, modeling a lot of our work off of the MSRE. So our design is in the, the top, our little conceptual cartoon, a reactor enclosure in the center, fuel handling on the left, uh, secondary uh, heat removal on the right. That mimics a, a lot what was done by the molten salt reactor experiment in the 60s. Next slide, please. 
So just uh, uh, Rob touched on this at the beginning, what is a university research reactor and how is it different than test reactors or other power producing reactors that we will hear about in this uh, session also. Uh, ACU plans to pursue this 104C uh, designation of being a, a research reactor. Um, and um, I guess for the sake of time, I'll skip on to the next slide. We are working here at Abilene Christian University to build a building to, to house this reactor um, using the uh, the uh, the uh, 10 CFR 50.10 exemption that allows us to build a reactor in a pre-existing building. We actually designed uh, last year. We have just broken ground this year on the facility that we're referring to as our Science Engineering Research Center. This is a, a multi-use facility that has some unique capabilities that will be ideal for siting a university research reactor. Uh, expected completion date is the middle of year next year in, in 2023. And next slide, please. This, is, uh, this image is a much more interesting image, in my opinion, of the building. Um, on the left, you see some specialized labs that uh, support the, uh, the reactor and the reactor design and work. But the really exciting part is the, the high bay, uh, research bay on the right. It's a, a very large room with a 40-ton crane over top. But this main feature is the trench on the bottom. If you go to the next slide, it should show us some dimensions. The trench is 25 feet deep, 15 feet wide, and, and 80 feet long in this 6,000 square foot uh, room. And so that, uh, that uh, trench in the middle of this high bay research area is an ideal place to drop in a research reactor, put a concrete shielding on the top, and you have a safe place to rapidly deploy and test uh, a, a research reactor, an advanced reactor at a university. Uh, next slide, please. And so I, I, I can't stop without thanking uh, the support we have. Uh, we've been supported from Excelsior Foundation, uh, Department of Energy through GAIN grants and NEUP grants. Development Corporation of Abilene has sponsored our work and of course our primary sponsors Insure Resources. Uh, thank you for your time, appreciate it. I'm glad to take questions. Thanks, Rusty. That, really appreciate that, that thorough assessment of what ACU is doing. I think research um, is an essential piece of developing and uh, deploying the next uh, generation of reactors. So how, what do you see are the most critical attributes of university research that can facilitate uh, the and expand the development and deployment of these new technologies? As was mentioned um, in the last talk, uh, molten salt reactors are a little lower technical readiness level than some of the other technologies that have been deployed multiple times. I mean, we have this great example of the MSRE in the 60s at Oak Ridge, but, um, but there are lots of areas where we really need to advance the technical readiness level. So everything from flanges to pumps, sills, valves, flow meters, um, all those really need to be advanced. Um, and so that we can uh, completely instrument a, a new reactor um, and do maintenance on. And so every one of those areas is an area where there needs to be some research. And, and that's a great place for a university to step in and help with. Um, and so, as I pointed out in that one slide, there's a lot of areas where we're developing the technology and, and we're, as we solve those problems that it gives us an ability to collect that intellectual property and, 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 and give a return to the industry that's investing in this advanced reactor. Thank you, Russ. Really appreciate that response. I think we'll certainly get some questions for you uh, as we go forward here. So next, I want to turn it to, to Margaret Ellison uh, to present on non-power and advanced reactor plans for Kairos uh, Pal. Thanks, Rob. All right, I see the slides there. Hello, my name is Margaret Ellenson. I'm a senior licensing engineer with Kairos Power. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak about Kairos's recent work on a non-power reactor construction permit application, as well as our advanced reactor development. Next slide, please. Kairos Power is a mission-centered organization. Our mission is to enable the world's transition to clean energy with the ultimate goal of dramatically improving people's quality of life while protecting the environment. I was recently speaking with a friend about this slide and they called it the slide with all the lights. And actually, the reason that this image is so powerful is that it's a reminder of how much of the globe is still dark. We as a part of the global community have important work to do to bring affordable, safe and clean energy to the market. Next slide, please. I'll start with an introduction to Kairos Power. 
KP is focused on commercialization of the Kairos Power Fluoride Salt Cooled High Temperature Reactor, or KPFHR. Just this past December, we celebrated our fifth anniversary and our staffing levels continually growing. We're now above 250 employees, a significant portion of which is engineering staff. In addition, KP has in place strong collaboration agreements with several national laboratories. KP's focus is on engineering design, licensing, and physical demonstration. And that last element is a key cornerstone of KP's development strategy. I'll speak to that strategy a little bit more in the next slide. Kairos's goal is for commercialization demonstration of a full KP FHR on or before 2030, while building the infrastructure for rapid deployment during the 2030s. KP has also set cost targets for the KP FHR to be competitive with natural gas in the US market. And this would accomplish our mission to deploy affordable energy that is both clean and safe. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates KP's development strategy and shows how KP uses a non-power reactor as a bridge to advanced reactor develop deployment. Traditional nuclear focuses on the design phase of, of development. And Kairos is changing that paradigm by using rapid iteration with hardware, including deployment of a non-power reactor. This is the merging of the two worlds that's the subject of this panel. Folks at Kairos like to say, hardware is worth a thousand calculations. And to that end, Kairos's development strategy is based on hardware iteration so that learning can be rapidly incorporated into design. Iteration is fastest in a non-nuclear environment, so KP's iterative loops include both nuclear and non-nuclear capabilities. Several of these iterative loops are shown on this slide. So starting on the far left, you'll see the Engineering Test Unit Demonstration Experiment, which we call ETUDE. It's a non-nuclear rig that uses simulated fluids to inform modeling capabilities. It's already been producing results for several years. Next is the engineering test unit, which we call ETU. This is also a non-nuclear unit. It'll have graphite pebbles in FLIB, which is KP's molten salt coolant. Construction is nearly complete of that unit in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and lessons learned from that ETU will be fed into the final design of Hermes. Hermes is the next uh, uh, loop on this slide, and you'll see it in the middle of the image. It is a non-power reactor that's a scaled version of a power reactor, and I'll talk more about the details of Hermes on the next slide. The next thing you'll see in the image is U facility, which is also a non-nuclear, but this time full-scale unit that will allow KP to incorporate learning about operations and maintenance before deployment of the full power KPFHR. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, now a little bit more about the Hermes reactor. Hermes is a non-nuclear power reactor. Uh, excuse me, Hermes is a nuclear non-power reactor. I flipped those two. At approximately 30% scale to the full power reactor, it will use HALU pebbles, online refueling, and FLIB molten salt coolant. It will prove Kairos's capability to deliver a KPFHR at cost targets. Now, the nuclear industry is very familiar with converting nuclear heat to electrical power. And that's why Kairos's objective for Hermes is to demonstrate low cost nuclear heat rather than electrical generation. By learning through the Hermes experience, Kairos will be able to incorporate lessons about manufacturing, materials, construction, and more on real hardware in ways that simulations can't support. Hermes also allows Kairos to exercise the supply chain for resources that we will need for the KPFHR. And it finally provides a complete demonstration of nuclear functions to inform operations, decision-making going forward. Ultimately, the Hermes iteration step allows Kairos to reduce design, supply chain, and regulatory risk while building vertical integration knowledge and capabilities. Can I have the next slide, please? Kairos Power is using the Part 50 license application process for Hermes and expects to do the same for the first KPFHR. This is sometimes referred to as the two-step application process. KP submitted the Hermes construction permit application to the NRC last fall, and it's under review by the NRC. 
It may not be intuitive that going through the process of licensing a test reactor would reduce regulatory risk for a power reactor. What Hermes allows Kairos to do is to identify challenges to the licensing process early, things like knowledge gaps or level of detail. So the construction permit itself is another form of rapid iteration on the path to advanced reactor deployment. It also affords Kairos the additional opportunities for strong pre-application engagement with NRC staff. This is another example of how iterative development strategy used by Kairos Power, along with demonstration through non-power reactor uh, units, puts Kairos Power on a path to accomplish our mission to enable the world's transition to affordable, safe, and clean energy. And Rob, that's the end of my prepared remarks. Thank you, Margaret. You, you touched on what I wanted to ask you about here in the, the presentation, so I'm going to ask you maybe just to elaborate a little bit. It's been a while since the last application for a research and test reactor license was submitted to the NRC. What specifically is driving the interest in RTRs now for advanced reactor developers? Yeah, yeah, it has been a while. So in recent decades, the landscape for reactor development has shifted. Um, there's a renewed support for using all the different tools available to mitigate the effects of climate change. And data shows that nuclear power is a key component of our clean energy future. So there's a variety of different technologies that are being developed right now, micro reactors, space reactors, advanced reactors, all sorts of things. So a non-power reactor application can be a useful development tool for both the developer and the NRC staff for new technologies. It also happens to fit well into the rapid iteration strategy that Kairos is using. Thank you so much for that, Margaret. That really helps uh, elaborate and understand the thinking that you're, you're employing as you can press on your RTR application and eventually the, the full Kairos uh, reactor uh, design will come to you. So uh, for our last formal presentation, I'd like to turn to Brad Tilmer, who will discuss the ongoing work at the National Reactor Innovation Center. Brad. Thanks, Rob. And hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. It's an honor to be here. Uh, Ashley Finan is our director. She was supposed to speak today. She sends her regrets. She had a conflict come up and she couldn't be here today. So you, you have me. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So I believe rapid deployment of advanced nuclear technology is more important today than ever. And you heard, you probably saw it two days ago on Tuesday, the International Energy Agency issued a press release. They, Global CO2 emissions rebounded to their highest level in history in 2021, coming out of the, the COVID-19 crisis. So we can't afford to wait. And I believe DOE and NREC are well positioned to rapidly deploy uh, technology, help to facilitate rapid deployment of technologies. Uh, as Allison stated, you know, the U.S. Department of Energy Nuclear Energy Program established NREC in FY 2020 following the passage of the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act. Our mission is really to partner with industry to bridge that gap between research and commercial deployment. It's not strictly a, a typical national lab program where we're doing all the research and, and we're, we are partnering with industry to bring these things uh, about. We are located at, Na at the Idaho National Lab. However, to achieve our mission, as Allison said, we are tapping into the resources and infrastructure of the entire national lab complex in the U.S. Uh, so we're bringing that resource to bear for, for uh, all the reactor developers. And we are bringing in an entire new approach to management demonstrations, uh, trying to manage demonstrations to success. We have a lean startup mentality. Uh, you know, I used to run a, a startup. If you work with us, you'll hear things like, let's do the hardest thing first and fail fast if we're going to fail, right? You'll hear minimum viable products. In this case, I'll show you some minimum viable test beds. Let's get something done quickly and we can work on uh, building out, better than building that out later. We're also bringing in a systems thinking and approach. It's not just a reactor that needs demonstrated to go commercial. We really need to develop the ecosystem to support that reactor. We're bringing in advanced engineering techniques such as digital engineering and systems engineering. And our team, we're building a team that has the background and knowledge to balance the needs of the public and private sector through partnerships. Next slide. So our vision is simple. We plan to demonstrate two advanced reactors by 2025 to enable commercial deployment by 2030. And we are on schedule to achieve this vision. 
And while that vision seems simple, the path to achieving that is complex and is going to require a lot of effort on a lot of people's parts. Next slide. So to accelerate demonstration employment of advanced reactors, we are trying to take a comprehensive approach that includes uh, inspiring stakeholders in the public. We have a lot of efforts that are associated with that. We're also trying to empower innovators by providing the tools and resources such that uh, such as test beds and exper experimental infrastructure. And I'm going to talk about some of those things as we go through this. And we're trying to deliver results through efficient coordination of partners and resources. So we'll be talking about how we're bringing together the industrial partners along with the, the lab complex and, and, and providing facilities, et cetera. Next slide. So partnering is the key here to everything we're doing. Enric is taking a comprehensive approach to partnering that brings together all the stakeholders necessary to demonstrate and deploy advanced technologies. This includes things like people like the private sector, other labs, government agencies, regulators, and others, essential tools and resources, facilities and capabilities. I mentioned a lot of those things. We do have a partnership, uh, a memorandum of understanding with the uh, NRC. We have two fo folks that are uh, assigned to us for the next year. Uh, working through and, and making sure that we we have those uh, uh, an eye on on the regulate, regulatory effort as we as we move these uh, partnerships forward. This partnership allows us to leverage the and the expertise and resources of a diverse stakeholder base and brings everyone together for a common cause. So we're bringing all these people together for the, for one common cause. Next slide, please. So our priority is empowering innovators, and we are doing this through a variety of tools and resources. As you uh, as you can see there, we are uh, we are looking at. I got to get the slide up. I can't see it up there. <laughs> We are, uh, we are leveraging existing infrastructure at INL and building two demonstration test beds. Allison mentioned both of those, and, but I do have a slide on one of them. Uh, we're providing this for give reactor developers an opportunity to take their reactors critical for the first time in a safe environment. Uh, and if you think about it, if each individual reactor developer had to create their own confinement to take their uh, reactor critical for the first time, it would inhibit uh, inhibit uh, tech, you know the it would be cost prohibitive for some some of those groups to do that to lead up to those demonstrations there are key pieces of the technology puzzle that must be resolved so to facilitate this and Enric is investing in a key in key expert experimental facilities that fill gaps in existing infrastructure I have a slide later on this that goes through each one of those uh, we are also investing in a virtual test bed where innovators can gain access to models so that they can do virtual tests prior to testing in physical demonstrations. And then we have a variety of regulatory and economic risk reduction programs. This is looking at, a, at things like from transportation and disposition of fuels, demonstration reactor safety design analysis. But one real interesting project that we just awarded is a cost shared project with GE Itachi. It's going to actually demonstrate, uh, further develop and demonstrate some advanced construction techniques and technologies that has the potential to decrease nuclear build costs by 10% and really reduce the risk of, the, of those builds as well. We're really excited about that. We just kicked that off in January. Um, but that is, that is part of that ecosystem that says, okay, we need to, do, uh, to, um, to demonstrate reactors, but we also need to make sure that they can be commercialized and, and, and advanced construction is very important to that. We're developing and deploying multiple planning tools that can help innovators move faster, things like uh, providing access to and funding for resources from around the National Lab Complex to consult on projects. So we, we provide funding to the National Labs to support uh, reactor developers as, as needed um, in a consulting role. So we're really bringing that entire lab complex uh, uh, expertise to the forefront. And we're developing tools for helping companies determine if a site is suitable. Uh, that's the stand tool. You can uh, you can get access most of these tools on our website. Can we go to the next slide? I'm running out of time here. So the next one is the Enric Dome uh, slide, which you know this is one of our test beds that Allison mentioned. It is demonstration. Dome stands for demonstration of micro reactor experiments. You know, we're really trying to enable. Uh, 
uh, what we're doing here is refurbishing the old EBR2 facility that operated from 1964 to 1994. It was a 62-megawatt equivalent reactor. Uh, produced, it, it operated for about 30 years, and then it was, uh, you know, mothballed. Uh, so we're re reinvigorating that, reestablishing it. And, and you know, we had a plan that the, the initial plan was, hey, let's, let's make this the most flexible uh, test bed. And, you know, it was going to cost a lot of money and it was going to it was going to do a lot of things. But we what we decided to do was, hey, we know we have about five reactor vendors that are very interested in this. Let's just make it so that they can test first. And then several years down the road, if we need to make it more flexible, we can add to it. So we went with a minimum viable test bed. It's just flexible enough to, to test these first four to five reactors, these small modular reactors, uh, using uh, you know less than 20% rich fuel. And we'll, you know we're going to provide them confinement so they can take their uh, reactors critical for the first time. We are oversubscribed for this uh, uh, test bed. We're going to have to you know schedule people in. We have our first customer coming in in, in 2024. Uh, we've already had a request uh, this past week for 2026, and we have other ones that want to get in 2025 and 2027. So we're we're working through all that. Uh, this is going to be a, a very good uh, opportunity for folks to to uh, test their reactors. As Allison mentioned, we do have another a safeguards category one. Uh, I don't have a slide on it, uh, but it was just actually officially uh, approved as a project uh, yesterday. Uh, so we'll be developing that uh, safeguards category one facility as well. Next slide. This slide is our uh, shows our Enric experimental test uh, test facilities that we're actually working. We're leveraging existing infrastructure at INL and building a helium compound at test facility. Um, this is part of that thing that to, to lead up to demonstrations. We really need to test some of these uh, high temperature gas reactor components in a non irradiated environment at at uh, at high temperatures and high pressures as, that they will see in the irradiated environment but you need to try them out before you get there things like the, the helium circulator the the uh, heat exchangers the control drums etc uh, we're also developing the molten salt thermophysical examination capability uh, this will be the only test facility that will allow researchers to test thermophysical properties of irradiated fuel salts uh, this is supposed to come online in 2024 uh, this will help inform modeling and simulation efforts and allow for more informed reactor design. Um, we also fund the uh, Mechanisms Engineering Test Loop Facility located at the Oregon National Lab. Uh, it is an intermediate scale liquid metal experimental facility. It provides purified R-grade sodium to various experimental test vessels. So you can test components that are required to operate in a prototypical advanced reactor environment. Uh, we also designing, building, and testing an in-cell thermal creep frame for the use with materials testing of advanced reactor materials. Uh, we're, and, and in addition, I, I mentioned the virtual test bed where innovators can gain access to models that they can use uh, to do virtual tests prior to uh, investing in physical demonstrations. Here again, we're, we're making available models from anywhere that people can access, including NRC's models. Um, next slide. So our goals, uh, we, you know, we're going to continue to prepare our vital infrastructure. Uh, we're going to demo cost-cutting technologies. For example, I mentioned the Advanced Construction Technology Initiative we just awarded. We're going to be working through that this year and, you know, preparing for a demonstration in the future of these technologies. Uh, we're going to, we anticipate, we're trying to anticipate regulatory needs and, and, and things such as streamlining the NEPA process. Uh, you know, when we say streamlining, we're trying to get it started earlier and so we can finish it earlier. Uh, we've also been uh, just authorized by DOE to establish a, um, a safeguards guide. I mentioned that already. Uh, we want to continue uh, to to build our team. Uh, we're not building a deep R&D bench, but we're bringing on folks that understand the urgency of the private sector and how to balance that urgency and how uh, with the public sector interest. Uh, and so we're, we're really building out that team. Most of our folks have a combination or we have some with uh, just industry experience that we're bringing in. So next slide. So we've done this before. The nation built 52 reactors over 25 years at the National Reactor Testing Station, which was the predecessor to the Idaho National Lab in Enric. Uh, we're gonna do it again. 
Uh, only this time, the private sector is going to be leading the way. Enric is going to bring in new ways of doing business uh, that is faster, more efficient, uh, such as, um, as I mentioned, systems thinking, the digital framework, advanced engineering techniques, et cetera. So hopefully, and, and, and all the rest of, around these partnership approach to uh, make things happen, bringing all the best minds and all the best resources together to achieve one common goal. So that's my uh, last slide today, Rob. Thanks so much, Brad. I really appreciate that. You, you uh, indicated that the NRC and NRC are, are working together and we're going to be sending some staff out there. We see a lot of value to the activities that NRC is undertaking. And the more we understand the information being collected and how it's going to be used, the more we can leverage it in our licensing approaches. So I think it's a great working relationship that we have between NRC and the NRC. So maybe a question to ask you to expand upon a little bit. As you develop these plans for all these activities that, that NRIC is going to take on, how are you keeping the capability for scaling the work um, in mind so that you can support as many vendors and technologies as possible? Yeah, uh, so I like to use a landscape and analogy of uh, sleeps, creeps, and leaps. When you first uh, have a landscaper come out and install plants in your, in, in your backyard or front yard, the first year the roots grow, but above the surface, it looks like the plants are, are not growing, so they're sleeping. The second year, the roots are still growing, and yet there is a little bit of growth, so it looks like they're creeping. And then finally, in the third year, most of the growth is above ground, above the surface, and you see uh, you know, what we call leaps. Uh, so sleep creeps and leaps. Enric is really following that kind of mold. You know, Enric is in the third year of existence. In the first couple of years, we were doing a lot of designing and building uh, the necessary foundation for these test beds and experimental infrastructure and you know building our talent to execute on projects developing the planning tools that i mentioned and expanding partnerships and resources across the lab now most of these things are going to be coming online or starting this year or over the next couple of years our, our big projects our big test beds will be over the next couple of years uh, so i think you're going to see a big leap in results a big scale up of, of results as we as we go forward I think we're in a good position in terms of being slightly ahead of the industrial teams that need our facilities and resources. So we're gonna be completing those uh, test pads just prior to uh, the, uh, the reactor vendors coming in and doing, uh, and doing testing. Of course, all this leap will be dependent on the continued availability of funding and resources for NREC. So, you know, as I don't know if you heard yesterday, the house passed last night, the house passed the omnibus, omnibus bill uh, last night, and if it's signed by the president, uh, if it's you know passed by Senate and signed by the president, you know we'll we'll see a, a good bump up in our 2022 budget over 2021, and this is great progress, and and you know we'll need even more in 2023 to to finish the uh, large scale test beds, but we're on a good trajectory, and I think uh, you know uh, the the foundation we're building today will will yield results in, in coming in the future. Thanks, Brad. Really um, do appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate the presentations from all of our uh, panelists today. They were phenomenal. I'm sure they're going to generate a bunch of questions. And we do see some already uh, coming in to us, so please continue to do that. So we're going to move now to the Q&A portion of the session. Um, so please continue to feel free to submit your questions based on the dialogue that, that continues or what you've heard in the presentations. Um, you can propose questions uh, to an individual or to the group at large. We'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can. We may not get to all the questions today, but we certainly appreciate those who are, are submitting them. So maybe the first question is one that goes to a few of us. Um, what is the current review schedule and review status of the applications received and pre-application engagements in projects? Maybe I'll start off and, and then ask uh, Margaret and Rusty to provide their perspectives as well on this. So the NRC last year did a substantial update uh, to our advanced reactive web page and included within that web page is the ability to see and track the progress of different applications that are that are coming into us so you can go to the kairos uh, portion of that web page and see all the pre-application work that came in under kairos that we have reviewed and what its current status is in addition we put a dashboard in place we're piloting a new dashboard on the kairos review that'll give the that gives the public a snapshot and perspective on the status of the review. And it's fed by real-time data out of systems here at the NRC as we track and, and manage the work. 
We've seen a substantial amount of pre-application engagement from Kairos, as well as a number of other vendors. And we're completing um, reviews of topical reports and white papers for those vendors so that they can have more predictability and reliability in the licensing process as they, they go forward. So you can find that also on our webpage and see and track all of the uh, ongoing reviews, both in uh, under review and those in pre application space. Margaret, do you want to provide any um, perspectives? Sure, yeah, thanks for, for providing that, that context for us, Rob. Um, yeah, Kairos is currently working through preliminary questions from the NRC staff. Uh, we're working in parallel to finalize the associated topical reports that will support the review of the PSAR and, uh, and also NRC's uh, development of a safety evaluation. Um, we're very happy to be continuing the um, pre-application engagement uh, activities that we've uh, had going throughout this application process. And that's been extremely helpful. And um, otherwise the review is proceeding on schedule as Rob mentioned, and with that dashboard review that uh, view that you can see on the website. Rusty, did you would you want to add anything to that, given your starting for application activities with the NRC and what your vision is relative to that? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, you're right, we've started our pre-application uh, engagement. Um, and there was a whole session on that. Hopefully people uh, were able to see that um, earlier this week, um, where NRC is encouraging pre-application. They certainly have encouraged us, and we've benefited from that tremendously at this point. Um, we have um, also benefited from um, looking at what others have done. And so we appreciate uh, Margaret and the whole Kairos team and what well, we're, we're, we have not submitted our construction permit. We expect to do that later this year, but we have uh, opened up an electronic reading room to start that pre-engagement docketing discussion. Um, and so this sort of early audit of individual components of a construction permit, we're finding that process very helpful. And, and overall, um, we've very much are thankful for the advice and feedback we're getting on a regular basis in that pre-engagement process. And so we're, we're uh, optimistic that uh, uh, licensing will not be the hurdle that everyone continues to, to look towards. Thank you so much for that, Rusty and, and Margaret. And we don't want, as was discussed by the commissioners, we don't want to be that impediment. We want to enable the safe use of these technologies. So we look forward to the engagements with, with companies such as both of yours. Um, the next question I have, uh, I think goes uh, best to Allison. Uh, what capability does the uh, versatile test reactor offer that things like the advanced test reactor and treat uh, cannot? Core. So this, this is a really good question. Um, VTR is a true test reactor, not a commercial plant. So VTR and Natrium both use sodium-cooled fast reactor technology, but they have very different missions with very different reactor cores and operating cycles. Um, if you switch in, in, in comparison to ATR, for fuels at least, ATR can really only simulate a thermal spectrum environment. VTR is essential if you're going to be um, developing fuels for fast, for fast spectrum reactors. And then um, on the materials side of the house, ATR can only impart DPA damage on the order of, of 10 DPA per year, whereas BTR can impart um, up to you know 30 plus. So for materials that are going to stay in a reactor for longer periods, especially fuel cladding, BTR is essential. Um, at a minimum, it, it's the difference between one year of irradiation in BTR versus um, three in ATR or two versus versus six and so forth. Thank you for that, Allison. I uh, really appreciate that. I think the next question uh, would go well to Brad. So what impact do you expect NREC to have on the nuclear industry at large? And how do you see NREC's mission changing as we progress and see advanced technologies begin to operate? No, well, we are, uh, you know, our our mission will change. So for, for right now, we are building the infrastructure necessary to do uh, the demonstrations that we envision, right? So once we once we transition to doing the uh, the demonstrations, we want to manage those demonstrations to success. Uh, you know, we're focused a lot right now on demonstrating high temperature gas reactors. There are other types of reactors. You know, we have uh, one customer is going to be using our facility, a safeguards category one facility is going to as a molten, a molten uh, chloride reactor. Uh, you know, there's a lot of technologies. So technologies are different in different stages of maturity, I would say. And so 
as we progress through one technology, we can we can move on to the next technology. But ultimately, you know, uh, you know, a few years down, ten years down the road or something, you know, you want to you want to work your way out of business, right? So you want to get to the point where things are commercial and you don't need this program anymore. So um, we consider ourselves similar to a startup. So you 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 we started up something here and we we're, we're working through that startup phase and you know we'll grow it into a bigger business and then we'll sell it, right? Really sounds like Enric can be a catalyst to so many different things um, that we can be deploying on these technologies. So uh, look forward to, to following the good work that you're doing. Here. So a question here um, that probably goes a little bit to me and to some others is, what are major attributes of a submittal that would positively influence and encourage an effective NRC review? And, and maybe I'll start and then and lean into to Margaret and Rusty as they pre as have prepared and are planning to prepare applications uh, to us. It, so first and foremost, that we can't underestimate or undersell the importance of effective pre-application. Recognize that these vendors are working on their technologies for years before they ever come in and engage with the NRC. And while the NRC has robust training programs for our staff to be prepared for different varieties of, of technologies, we won't be familiar with the unique safety and operational profiles for the facilities that are, the vendors are developing unless we get early engagement with them. And that can so effectively influence whether we hit the ground running and how effectively we hit the ground running when the review um, comes in. And Kairos is a perfect example of that. The, the pre-application that Kairos did has allowed the NRC to set a very aggressive review schedule of 21 months and establish a, a resource estimate that we're effectively managing and currently under uh, burning uh, relative to the, the budget that we propose. So we're affecting the review in a very focused and systematic way because of the good work that Kairos did on that. The other, another thing I'd, I'd really emphasize is in the applications, make sure you tie that nexus between the risk uh, aspects of the design what's, and the safety profile for the facility. Make sure we understand what you perceive to be the most important uh, design attributes and uh, the most risky, the risk, uh, most risk significant elements of the design. Because the better we understand that and align on that very early in the review, the better we'll be positioned to focus our review on those aspects and spend less resources and effort um, in in the actual review. And finally, as the chairman said in his opening remarks, make sure you show your work in the application. Okay. There's a lot of we want, we hear you. We we want these designs to be safe. Provide the basis for why and the work that you did those attributes and the safety profiles are, are demonstrated. Because otherwise, if we, you make an assertion without the supporting rationale behind it, we're gonna have to ask the question to seek to understand why. Um, so those are the kind of things I'd emphasize. Margaret, Rusty, do you guys wanna weigh in on this? Yeah, I can I can kick it off if, if you like, Rusty. Um, uh, I absolutely agree with your points about pre-application engagement and being clear about defining the, um, the, the, the truly risk significant uh, aspects of the application um, that we have found that to be a, a very powerful and important um, aspect of pre-application and, and to uh, positively influence, as the question said, the uh, uh, effective NRC review. Um, I'd also say that Delivering an application that focuses on the finding that the NRC needs to make, uh, we, we put a lot of thought and effort into what is it that we actually need a finding about and really tailoring the content of the application and focusing the application on what do we need to support that finding. Um, that it's important because it, it not just uh, make sure that we put the right information into the application, but also that we don't distract the review with other unnecessary details. Um, and uh, we've also found that uh, topical reports have been a, a great tool to be able to align on the less necessary level of detail, as well as the pre-app engagement on the application itself. Um, so both of those things uh, have been very useful tools to us to make sure that we can deliver an application that supports the finding that NRC needs to make. So. I'll just say it's a great question. Um, it's very, it's, it's a question we're asking almost daily here as we're in the midst of writing our RCP and, and but certainly pre-engagement is helpful to get some of those answers. Um, 
And uh, I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of guidance out there that's being developed for advanced reactors. Um, obviously, as that continues to grow and gets tailored for the different technologies, that will be helpful. Um, but um, right now, this is just a great question. We're, we're trying to answer it the best we can every day. Great. Thank you. So maybe the next question I think is a good one because it opens it up to everybody. And I, I welcome who wants to weigh in on this question. What do you see as some of the most significant long-term technical barriers to developing advanced reactor technologies? Is there anybody who wants to maybe start us off on that? I can chime in if you like, Rob. Um, just from KP's perspective, we don't see particular technical challenges that are not resolvable. Um, we use our rapid iterative development approach um, that allows us to learn from building real hardware. Um, it also allows us to resolve substantial technical challenges very quickly. Um, uh, we do need to, uh, part of our objective is to achieve cost certainty. And uh, so to do that, we need to prove both technology certainty, supply chain and manufacturing certainty, licensing certainty, construction certainty, all these things. Um, so that's why we're heavily investing in testing and manufacturing infrastructure as the best way to resolve those technical roadblocks. Some other things that come to mind that perhaps are well known, um, the reliable sources of HALU, that high enriched low assay fuel. Um, but we don't necessarily see that as a, a barrier to technological development, um, just something that we need to, to work through with uh, industry, DOE, NGOs. Um, and then also a couple other points uh, perhaps is uh, an important challenge is workforce, uh, making sure that we have the right expertise both in the development industry and in the NRC uh, or other government bodies to be able to support deployment. And, um, and then lastly, it's not really a hard technological barrier, but the viewpoint that um, that can hamper technological development is the idea that all systems at a reactor site need to have a higher pedigree than other hazardous industries. Um, so really making sure that we're consistent with a uh, state of knowledge, not just for the nuclear industry, but for all, for all um, hazardous industries. So those are a few thoughts. Thanks, Margaret. Anybody else want to weigh in? Allison? I don't want to... I don't want to speak for, for industry, of course, but some of the challenges that we've heard on our side is um, cost and schedule for construction. And I know that Brad had mentioned it briefly, but NREC has our Advanced Construction Technology, ACT, initiative um, that could significantly reduce the cost and schedule for advanced reactor construction. Um, uh, I mentioned the versatile test reactor in the presentation, but having prototypic conditions to test materials and fuel um, which is what BTR would do, um, and, and the test beds. Having those test beds to bring in and have infrastructure to test these um, designs in a safe environment um, could certainly help the deployment. Thank you for that, Allison. Russ, you want to in on that one? I'll, I'll just uh, reiterate, I think Margaret gave a great answer. I think that the technical hurdles um, are, are are not the biggest hurdles in this project. Um, in fact, um, we, you know, we can do, we, the technology has been deployed before, it can be deployed again. Um, certainly there's room for optimization. And so I see that as, as a lot of the areas we're working on is how can we make it uh, more efficient, more cost effective? And so then you come right back to the issues of how can you de-risk the whole process of, of developing or more importantly, deploying. And I think that's where more of the risk is, is not in, can we, can we build a reactor or can we license one, but can you somehow de-risk the process and provide certainty on commodities, on pricing and schedule so that it's de-risk as you think about deploying this uh, technology? Thank, thank you for that, Rusty. Maybe while I have you, the next question I think is really good for you and something we, we should always keep in mind. Um, so how do, you, how do the universities support the pipeline for future engineers and scientists? Are students interested in nuclear developments? Are you seeing a growth in interest in, in nuclear engineering uh, types of pathways? 
Uh, so the short answer is yes. Um, we have tremendous um, student interest in this project. Um, the, the, every incoming student has anything to do with STEM uh, wants to hear about this project. And uh, last summer we had uh, 65 students working on the project here at Abilene Christian University. Um, those students primarily came from ACU, but they also came from our partner schools. Um, this year, uh, without advertising, we've had uh, students apply from uh, seven different uh, universities um, to, to, to come and work with us this summer. Um, we have also been told by our, our Research Alliance schools that their graduate program um, enrollment or applications is way up because there are students that are hearing about the project and want to figure out how they can be part of it. And so there, there's certainly students there. I mean, clearly, um, if you can if you can take your skill set and apply it to real world problems and develop the technology that's going to help address some of the world's most critical needs, that's something that that students love to be involved with. And and we really view you know a central part of our mission is that workforce development and how can what can we do to help educate that next generation of scientists and engineers that are going to be critical to to not only operate these advanced reactors but help continue to develop their designs and and deployment. And so that's something we. We enjoy doing, um, it obviously brought, brings a lot of energy in the project when you have a, a bunch of, of students working on it. Um, and one of, the, one of the joys is this is a, a real world, very uh, interdisciplinary project. And so our students come, come from all different backgrounds, not just nuclear engineers, but uh, all flavors of engineering and chemistry and physics um, and even math and computer science. And so we have a lot of student interest in the project. And so I don't think we have to worry about it. it, it the, the student interest is there. We're going to be able to fill that uh, work pipeline as long as, as the universities are ready for the flood. That's great, Rusty. I think uh, in some previous presentations this week, we talked about uh, the commissioners and, and Dan and others talked about the, the significant hiring that the NRC has to do. And we recognize that the industry is doing significant hiring as well, as well as DOE as they stand up the Clean Power Project organization. So that pipeline is so critical and it's so exciting to see that uh, enthusiasm and invigoration in um, young individuals entering STEM and doing research and technology that will support us all as we progress forward. Um, the next question I, I think goes best to Allison and Brad. Um, what is the benefit of DOE and NREC supporting multiple designs and vendors compared to focusing resources on one. Yeah, so I can start off there. I was looking at Brad to see if he was jumping in, but um, we have set very ambitious climate change goals, um, net zero by 2050. We're going to need a diverse set of um, reactor designs to meet those goals and to support energy resilience and security. Um, but it really falls back on it is not DOE's role to, to pick the winners. Um, we are here to reduce the technical risks for the broadest set of reactor designs. And, and um, each design offers unique features which, which could meet different missions. And so we really want to try to um, address as many, as many reactor types as possible. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything Allison said. I would just add that um, it's up to the individual companies to focus on what they think is best. We're going to allow people to come in and, and test their systems that they're focusing on. So we don't have to pick the winners, as Allison said. So and coming from the private sector into this, you know, we, I was in, in charge of developing technologies, and we, we wouldn't want uh, DOE picking the winner. We would want to focus on what we think we can do best and get, have the best opportunity to commercialize that. And you never know what's gonna derail a project. So you can, so DOE could focus on one technology and you could get down to the end and it might be financing, it might be something else that'll, that'll destroy the project. Uh, whereas if you have a portfolio or a, a pipeline of technologies that you can get, that's in the best public good, you know, because you're gonna, you're gonna eventually get a winner out of that pipeline. And that, that's gonna be uh, where, and, and actually deploying that technology is going to be where the public good comes in. So I think it, this partnership allow the allow the uh, allow the demonstrators to focus on what they think is best and give multiple uh, and, and the DOE give multiple opportunities to multiple people to uh, to the companies to try to bring technology to the forefront, sort of make it a competitive race type thing. And there's lots of different applications for a lot of different technologies as well. So you know it's uh, you know that's. That's another thing is, uh, you know, it depends on the market you're, going to, you're targeting. Great. 
thank you both uh, for that. Uh, I think a good question here uh, for Margaret is, uh, while Hermes is going to help with the engineering of the full power reactor, how will the siting process for the Hermes help cars on the efficient siting of the full scale power reactor? Hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. It's uh, uh, as far as the um, requirements go for a difference between a non-power reactor and a power reactor, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of similarities. Um, the the NEPA regulations can be exercised through the non-power reactor as well. Um, uh, part of what makes it very similar for this test reactor is uh, uh, is kind of a full exercising of that process. Um, uh, there are a couple of differences about the, the type of data that can be um, uh, cited for a non-power reactor versus a power reactor, that type of thing. But um, uh, in general, I think it, it uh, a lot of the processes are similar. A lot of the um, uh, uh, steps that we will need to go through to, to do a siting analysis and to do uh, the environmental report development are similar. So there's a lot of lessons that we can learn through the non-power reactor application as well. Um, and we're obviously working through some of the questions with the NRC now on the environmental report review that supports the Hermes application. And um, we're excited to see uh, that great progress is being made there um, on a really fantastic schedule. So uh, good work uh, happening on, on that front, I would say. Great. Uh, thank you for that, Margaret. Uh, the next question, um, I think I want to propose to folks, and, and I'll certainly uh, seek to answer, but maybe I'll hold mine to, to the last here, is how are you working with international partners to develop and regulate advanced reactor technologies? Um, Allison, I know DOE does a lot of work in this area. Could, could you elaborate on your, your perspectives on how we do that? Of course. So we have a number of bilateral and, and multilateral um, collaborations with countries on this advanced reactor technologies. Um, we are also, um, 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 sorry, Gen4 Gen International Forum, I had to spell it out in my mind. Um, we are also um, uh, a part of that with some other like-minded countries looking at a, a variety of advanced reactor technologies. Um, and so it's really, we, we deal, we recognize as the, the importance of these collaborations to leverage um, the limited resources we have sometimes and to have a seat at the table to provide um, uh, input on safety, on safety decisions as it goes forward with, uh, across, the, across the globe. Does anybody else want to weigh in before I do? I, I won't speak to the regulatory part of the international cooperation, but I, I will say that um, the, the need to develop a pipeline of, of, of next generation uh, leaders is something that uh, countries have already identified um, as a need if they wanna consider going nuclear. Um, and so we've been approached by some countries and their universities at, in those countries what would it look like to partnership at a, a university level to help develop that pipeline? Um, you have access to an advanced reactor if they're considering being a, a new nuclear country. And so, so international cooperation is, is huge. Um, I think it's on the regulatory side, it's a pipeline development side. Um, I think it's something that's it's great to work with our, our international partners. Great, thanks, Bustin. Maybe I'll just weigh in here. The NRC is placing, a, if you've been watching some of the other presentations, including the one before this with Dan Dorman and some of our international um, counterparts, the NRC is placing a huge emphasis on international engagements, either through things like the NRC and CNSC Memorandum of Cooperation, which includes something we're discussing now that may involve NRIC in the future and as an opportunity to, to engage. Um, we see those as, as critical because those are the first steps to looking at how do we license potentially and leverage uh, similar approaches to making regulatory decisions uh, in countries. And, and Canada and the NRC have a lot of similarities in our regulatory uh, approaches, but we're not stopping there. We know that there's lots of good work that the International Atomic Energy Agency is doing. It would participate in things like this uh, small modular reactor regulators forum there and share our perspectives and gain perspectives from another, a number of other uh, uh, member states to the IAEA. 
And then a good example is work we've done with NEA on uh, fuel qualification. There was a working group there that developed an approach for fuel qualification. It could be an international approach. We've taken that and adapted it slightly and incorporated it into our regulatory guidance as well. So we're trying to leverage those good practices that are done internationally and share our good practices so that we can streamline the ability of countries to leverage the work uh, done in other countries. So we see that as a critical activity going forward because advanced reactors are not just a, a national uh, project. They're an international and a global project that the, most of these companies are emphasizing the importance of deployment uh, in other countries as well. So the more we do to standardize our approaches, uh, the more we can streamline uh, that aggressive um, deployment and ultimately end up with uh, the value that we were hoping to see, which is its effects on climate change and things like that. So I think it's a great opportunity. Um, so Sorry about that, I muted myself unintentionally. Uh, what additional tools or resources would facilitate developing new technologies and getting them to market? I can weigh in, Rob, if you like. Um, there's some technology development areas that are suitable for standard standardization, maybe cross implementation. Um, there's been a few technology working groups or TWIGs that have been established, and we found those to be beneficial. Um, we anticipate, uh, we, for example, we currently participate in the uh, molten salt high temperature reactor working group. Um, and it has helped with the development of the TRISO fuel topical report that we have developed um, and establishes a technical baseline for the TRISO testing work that will be done at LANL. Um, there's other opportunities for common development. Um, and I think while not an exhaustive list, some other examples of cross technology development might be generic PERTs for common phenomena and perhaps making uh, modeling capabilities uh, and expertise that can be used by both industry and NRC. So those are two thoughts that come to mind. Anybody else have any perspectives? Um, so one thing I'll just add to, to uh, it's of concern to ACU is the uh, research reactor infrastructure program from the Department of Energy. Um, as a university research reactor, we're, we're looking to, uh, to partner with Department of Energy to get our fuel. And this is a, obviously a new fuel form for them in, in the advanced reactor world. And so that, uh, that partnership is something that um, we are, we are um, relying on and they can't do their job without, uh, I guess, uh, uh, funding. And so we're, we're watching funding bills on making sure that they're, they're, that uh, department is, is, gets the resources they need. And then looking down the road in terms of uh, commercial deployment, I, I think something that we have to address as a, a nation is if we're rapidly deploying um, small modular reactors or micro reactors, the licensing process has to be streamlined. And, and what does that even look like? That's something that we probably all should look at as a, together and think about what that process might look like. I couldn't agree more, Russ, on that one. And I think one of the things, it's a theme, I think, to all of the presentations we've heard today is the work that's being done in research and development and those activities are critical to this because they're gonna provide and identify the best practices that can be employed, employed across technologies that are technology neutral in a lot of different respects. Some of it will be technology specific if it's related to the, the fuel and the, the design of the reactor, but a lot of things like construction, there's a lot of lessons learned and good experiences from the activities at Vogel on construction that we need to not lose or, or overlook um, as we prepare for constructing new and advanced uh, reactors going forward. So there's, we've got to be able to share that information and glean the best practices and then have everybody understand them so they can take them into account and incorporate them in their activities and their preparations. Um, so for the next question, it, it goes to me and um, it relates to the OCLO review. And it asks if OCLO resubmits and closes the information gaps identified, do you expect the application review to be able to resume uh, where it left off? Um, that is our desire. 
we want to leverage as much as we accomplished in the Oklo review and the working relationship we established uh, with Oklo during that review. Um, we didn't start some portions of the review because we we're focused on getting the key safety profile understood in that design. So once we nail down that safety profile and resolve those issues uh, with Oklo, it should help streamline and focus our efforts and activities on that review. And I think Oklo is committed to that as well. So we're we're starting the discussion about um, the schedule for resubmittal and how we're going to engage between now and when they do so to try to drive those issues uh, to closure and get the information we need as the regulator to make our, our safety findings. So we're excited to, to resume those activities with Oklo when they're ready to engage and work with us. Um, here's a question that's a little bit different. And um, we've been focused a lot on fission technologies in the discussion, and most of you are focused on that as well. But we recognize fusion technologies out there. NEMA acknowledges that our frameworks have to work, the NRC's frameworks have to work for licensing of fusion technologies as we go forward. And, and we're very conscious of that as we prepare our approaches and think about how fusion technology may be uh, regulated in the future. But how do you, how do folks fe feel or think about fusion technology fitting into the future of non-power and advanced reactors? And maybe Allison might be a good place for you to start because I know DOE is doing some work if you're, if you're comfortable. Yeah, so DOE does do work in fusion reactors. It's more through the um, Office of Science, and I believe ARPA-E does work with fusion as well. Um, but like I said before, the, to, to meet our energy goals, we're going to need a variety of, of reactors. And, and if fusion technology is able to be deployed within that time frame, then absolutely, there's a, there's a spot on the board for them as well. Excellent. Anyone else? I know Kairos isn't pursuing it, not being Christian, so I didn't know if anybody else had a perspective on fusion based on their experiences. Um, but I do appreciate the individual asking. And the NRC is definitely engaged on activities related to fusion and preparing uh, for that. We know there's a, the Fusion Industry Association out there is, is working with a number of potential developers and technologies uh, related to that. And the question becomes, what is the regulatory footprint that really needs to exist for fusion technologies? They potentially have substantial safety benefits and risk profiles that um, may warrant treating them different than we've treated historically production and utilization uh, facilities. So we're looking at that and, and thinking about what the right uh, approach for that will be uh, going forward. And we, we encourage engagement on that. One of the things maybe I wanna to touch on for folks is this panel is just one of many things we do um, as the NRC for public and stakeholder engagement as we emphasize uh, openness and transparency in our principles of good regulation. We have routine public meetings about every six weeks on the advanced reactor program and where we're going as an agency. And we bring in many entities uh, to help us uh, and discuss and dialogue various aspects uh, during those meetings. And we discuss the status and updates, um, key guidance and rulemaking activities and things like that, uh, that we're doing. And in addition, we're doing a number of we're doing extensive stakeholder outreach on part 53, which we think will be instrumental and critical in the future for licensing these advanced technologies because it's going to provide a more performance-based, technology-inclusive and risk-informed approach to how to license and look at designs like Kairos, designs like what Abilene Christian is, is doing, and how can that be more efficient? And then taking into account the differences between the requirements in the Atomic Energy Act under Section 103, which is for power reactors, and Section 104, which is for non-power uh, reactors. So we have to factor all of those things into what we're doing. So we're just about out of time and we're not, not seeing any more questions uh, come in. So I'm gonna go ahead and suggest that we wrap up uh, this session. I wanna express my profound appreciation to the panelists. Today, I found your presentations insightful and uh, thought provoking. So I think we have a lot of work and I think we're all partners in getting to the end, respecting our individual roles um, but if we're going to get to the deployment of advanced reactor technologies, um, we have to all communicate and continue to work together effectively. So thank you all for your time today, and I appreciate it. And I thank the audience for the questions that they have proposed. So with that, let's go ahead and close up this session. And everybody have a wonderful uh, day.